U.S.-China tensions are boiling in Southeast Asia. China is trying to influence the region, and Indonesia is at the center of it. Welcome to China Uncensored. I'm Chris Chappell. This episode is sponsored by Surfshark. Whenever you go online, especially to look into controversial topics, you should be using a VPN like Surfshark to protect your identity. So this month, Southeast Asia has taken center stage for geopolitics. Take that, Russia, Ukraine, North Korea. Southeast Asia is number one, baby. Three high-level meetings, the East Asian Summit, the G20 Summit, and the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum were held within a week or so in Cambodia, Indonesia, and Thailand. A lot of issues were on the table, such as Russia's invasion of Ukraine, ongoing threats from North Korea, and the violent crisis in Myanmar. Which is sad, because it means that even when Southeast Asia wins, all anyone wants to talk about are the other guys. But the big elephant in the room is the conflict between the U.S. and China. This makes members of ASEAN nervous. ASEAN stands for the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Its members include these 10 Southeast Asian nations. None of them want to be forced to choose between China and the US. Because who could give up that sweet, sweet Chinese money? I'm starting to think China puts crack in their money. Because after just one taste, everyone is super addicted to it. ASEAN has been China's biggest trading partner since 2020. And China is integral to ASEAN's economic development. According to China, two-way trade has grown by 85 times from 1991 to 2021. China has been ASEAN's largest trading partner for 13 consecutive years. And China has also been ASEAN's second largest foreign direct investor behind the U.S. That's why Southeast Asian countries don't want to have to pick. Which explains why the official themes of each summit have strong kumbaya vibes. Give profit a chance. I mean, peace, give peace a chance. Here's the Cambodian Secretary of State. In our view, uh, China-U.S. relations is the most important relations that matters not just to the two countries, but also our regional development as well. And I can't emphasize enough, you know, that ASEAN uh, remains neutral in this, uh, you know, competition. Uh, we don't want to choose side. And frankly speaking, we want to work closely with both countries. Man, he sounds like a kid with divorced parents trying to keep both of them in his life so he can get two Christmases. No matter what the U.S. does, the Chinese Communist Party will keep pushing its agenda, trying to make Southeast Asian countries its pawns. For example, China wants to counter America's 14-nation Indo-Pacific economic framework, which addresses things like fair trade, supply chain resilience, and improved infrastructure. Essentially, America teamed up with several nations to try and improve everyone's situation, and China said, and I took that personally. This is even more relevant now that the U.S. is imposing export controls on semiconductors and chip-making equipment. China doesn't want restrictions on its manufacturing supply chains, which is why it's pushing to implement what it calls the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. It's the world's largest free trade agreement. Earlier this year, ASEAN, along with Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and South Korea, all agreed to join. That translates in practice as closer integration of supply chains, infrastructure connectivity, and the building of a new international land-sea trade corridor. That would sure help China get around U.S. sanctions. China is also seeking to improve trade directly with ASEAN, using what Chinese state media calls an ASEAN-China Free Trade Area version 3.0. Version 1.0 established zero tariffs for 90% of shipped goods. Version 2.0 further opened up market access. And version 3.0 is expected to adopt more industrial cooperation. According to Shi Zhongjun, Secretary General of the ASEAN China Center, this includes focusing on the digital economy and the green economy. And who would know better about a low carbon green economy than China, the country that emits more carbon than the rest of the developed world combined? At any rate, these Chinese trade agreements are putting Indonesia front and center of China's goal to take over Southeast Asia. I'll explain more after the break. Welcome back. China is on the offensive in Southeast Asia. 
The Chinese Communist Party's number two guy, Li Keqiang, held talks with Cambodia's prime minister and king. China's vice premier, Han Zheng, visited Singapore. And of course, Xi Jinping himself visited Indonesia. That's because Indonesia is particularly important. Of course, she was mostly in Indonesia because the G20 summit was there. It's a meeting of the world's 20 largest economies. But Xi Jinping has also shown his interest in Indonesia by allowing its president, Jaco Widodo, to be the first foreign leader to visit Beijing after the Olympics earlier this year. He's done everything short of surprising them with a box of chocolates and a trail of rose petals and candles leading from the front door to the bedroom, which is filled with piles of that sweet, sweet addictive Chinese money. After the G20 summit in Bali, China and Indonesia signed a number of bilateral agreements. These include a plan to merge Indonesia's maritime goals with China's Belt and Road Initiative, an agreement to expand and deepen trade collaboration, and memorandums of understanding for joint scientific development, vocational training, and digital economy cooperation. Why is China putting so much attention on Indonesia? Well, it has the fourth largest population in the world, it controls shipping lanes across Southeast Asia, and it's a major player in regional politics. It also has a fifth of the world's global nickel reserves, which is vital for electric vehicle supply chains. As a huge player in the EV industry, you bet China wants in on those resources. Indonesia also happens to be getting the chairmanship of ASEAN next year. It rotates each year between the ASEAN countries. With that in mind, it's pretty obvious that China wants to get on Indonesia's good side. Indonesia, in turn, seems to be more eager to cooperate with China. It's even willing to resume joint military training exercises. This is despite the fact that China and Indonesia have clashed over the Natuna Islands in the South China Sea, especially in 2019 and 2020. This area falls into Indonesia's exclusive economic zone, but Chinese fishing vessels, some of which are part of China's maritime militia, have been fishing those waters anyway. These are gray zone tactics, incursions that are short of war but still assert power over other nations. And these tactics are very familiar to other ASEAN countries that have dealt with China in the South China Sea. Indonesian maritime law enforcement officials claim these incursions have not stopped since then, they have simply become less publicized. So what gives? Why is Indonesia doing military training exercises with an authoritarian regime that threatens its own territory? That's like opening the savings account with a bank that's trying to foreclose on your home. Well, it's not that Indonesia is ignorant of China's maritime ambitions. Indonesia is beefing up its naval fleet of submarines and corvettes to counter China in the Natuna Sea. And according to a survey conducted last year by the Lowy Institute, an Australian think tank, Indonesians are growing more wary of China. Compared to 2011, more Indonesians think their country should join others to limit China's influence, and fewer believe that China's growth has been good for them. At this point, the Chinese Communist Party is like cigarettes. If someone says they don't know they're bad for you, they're either lying or stupid. The problem is Indonesian policymakers. They are hooked on Chinese investment, especially when it comes to infrastructure. China is offering so many collaborative projects, who could say no to them? So politicians prefer to downplay the conflict. Kind of like how mob wives prefer not to think about how their husbands are able to afford getting them so much nice jewelry. While Indonesia does push back against China's gray zone tactics, responses are often made in private. Either that, or they're done in a largely symbolic manner without real teeth. Indonesian policymakers are prone to viewing gray zone incursions as short-term maritime law enforcement problems, rather than a wider strategic gambit by China. Indonesia compartmentalizes the problem by separating its bilateral ties with China from the North Natuna Sea issue, the South China Sea dispute, and great power politics. So their entire military strategy is, this is fine. Indonesia also sees China as a good counterbalance against the U.S., given that a lot of Indonesians have negative views of U.S. interventionism. So on the off chance that the U.S. might intervene, they're working with a country that's actively intervening. Good strategy. 
The Biden administration is trying to counter Chinese influence in Indonesia and other ASEAN states with a new era in U.S.-ASEAN relations. For the administration, that means wooing ASEAN countries away from highly lucrative trade with China with more U.S. help in areas including climate action, health, and energy. This is like one big geopolitical game of The Bachelor. Will they give the rose to China or the U.S.? But the problem is ASEAN's priorities don't align with Biden's Indo-Pacific strategy. For one, the strategy says that the United States will be a partner in strengthening democratic institutions, the rule of law, and accountable democratic governance. Um, not everyone wants that, especially authoritarian governments. Literally half of ASEAN countries are communist, fake democracies, or just straight-up dictatorships. They think letting their citizens vote is like asking their dog where they want to go for dinner. The idea of excluding China isn't very appealing to them, especially if it means they also have to have transparent governance and horrible things like that. And especially since, back in May, the U.S. only offered a measly $150 million in development money split among all 10 ASEAN countries. Really, it all comes down to money. And America's isn't as addictive as China's, since there isn't as much of it. Many ASEAN states see the Biden administration's regional economic plan, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity, as a bunch of talk with few concrete actions, especially if the United States does not include expanding market access. Biden is trying to woo them once more by launching the U.S.-ASEAN Comprehensive Strategic Partnership to reinforce maritime cooperation, environmental goals, women's empowerment, and economic cooperation. But as long as China keeps pumping money, ASEAN countries will want to continue allowing China to build their infrastructure. This is something the U.S. needs to keep working on, even when Southeast Asia is no longer on the center stage for geopolitics. And this episode is sponsored by Surfshark. When you go online, everything you do is being tracked and logged by the websites you visit and your internet service provider, and in many cases, by your government. And it's not just in China. People around the world are being monitored constantly, including in those not-so-free countries in Southeast Asia. And that's why no matter where you live, you should always be keeping your internet activity private using a VPN like Surfshark. Surfshark now has servers in over 100 countries, more than any other VPN. So that makes your connection faster and more reliable. Plus, Surfshark has top-of-the-line encryption and a no-logs policy, meaning they don't collect your browsing data. So check out Surfshark. With just one account, you can connect as many devices as you want. So try it out now. Surfshark has a special deal that includes 83% off a two-year plan, plus three extra months for free. You can protect yourself for just $2.21 a month. So go to surfshark.com uncensored and use the code uncensored to secure this deal. The link is in the description below. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. Thanks for watching China Uncensored.